Hello there, welcome back to my workshop. Today we're going to be looking at this lovely Amstrad PC2286. This model of computer has a lot of nostalgia for myself. I used it in one of my first jobs when I learned to program at C. I was taught by my friend Mark. I know that he watches, so hello Mark. Sorry I wasn't very good at learning, <laughs> but Mark was very good at programming in C. Anyway, we had lots of Amstrads. We had 2286, 2086, some of the PPCs and the old 286 as well, lots of Amstrads. So I had an eBay search going and one eventually popped up, the usual story, uh, not working, untested, and looking at the auction, the screen did have power, but that was it. There was no display, there was no text. So I talked to the seller Scott, who was a very nice chap, and we did a service station meetup. So the plans for the video are to do the basic safety checks, make sure that it's not going to explode when we first turn it on, and then work our way through the problems. You'll see that I've got a bag of screws already, so I have made a start. I pretty much know what we're going to find, but that doesn't mean that I know how to fix those problems at this time. So there we go, that's the backstory of why I wanted one of these. Now let's get it working. So here we have the front of the unit. It is a PC 2286-40. So it does have an internal hard drive. The keyboard is definitely a bit of state. We've got keys missing. I think I'm just going to take this off. and We'll get rid of that later. We have a monochrome monitor that sits on the top. And it's quite yellowed in places. Underneath the monitor, there is the compartment for the batteries for the battery backup. And thankfully, there were no batteries in there, so there was no corrosion from the batteries. On the side, we have a speaker. We have the power switch. Then down at the bottom, key lock, keyboard and mouse, as well as a volume control. On the back, we have a video output serial parallel and then switches that control the type of the video output. The, the other side has an external hard drive with an external power unit, so uh, it can provide power to the drive. And then we have the expansion base. Then the back cover slides off. And we can see inside, and that's the hard drive controller that is inside. I've already removed all the screws, so we can just take this top off. So you'll see everything inside. If I just disconnect the batteries. So we have floppy drive, hard drive, power supply. To get access to the actual motherboard, we have to go underneath. It's on the bottom of the case. So normally the first thing that I would do would be to check the power supply. So I'm going to disconnect everything. So you can see that there is the, there's one power lead that goes down to the bottom of the board. I'm going to check the uh, 5 volt and ground. Um, the power switch is on the side. I'm plugged into my RCD. So turn it on. But it basically does nothing. The fan tries to spin, but it won't do anything else. Um, I don't have the service guide at this time. I'm not really sure what part it needs to power up. All I can really do is check that there's no short circuits. So there's definitely nothing shorted between the red and the black wires. So that's just connected to the to another black. Let's do a continuity yellow, blue, white, red, red, and then black and black. So there's definitely no dead short on the power supply. Let's just check one of these. Should all be the same. So I'm guessing there's some capacitance on the 5 volt line there. Uh, so all I'm going to do really is just connect it back up. So we don't have any of the accessories plugged in. We need, we need to check those. So let's try again. We do have a spin. doesn't make a beep or anything. So let's try connecting up the monitor. So wow, it's working. So there you can see, faulty floppy 
disk controller or disk drive. So let's just connect up items one by one. So I've just connected up the floppy drive. Let's try a different slot. There we go. Please set date and time. Please check keyboard. Let's plug in the keyboard. So I'm not quite sure what's going on. The scroll lock lights are not working on the keyboard. The caps lock light isn't working. So definitely some issues with the keyboard. Let's check the hard drive as the last item. So let's turn it on with the hard drive connected. And it, it basically switches itself off. So there must be some kind of protection in here. Let's disconnect the power to the hard drive. Yeah. So there's definitely some problem with the hard drive. I need to look at the keyboard and the keyboard controller because it's it's uh, Amstrad's own keyboard controller. So we can't just use an, another keyboard. Before we go over to the workbench, let's quickly have a look at the bottom where the actual PC is. So we take that panel off, then you can see the actual PC inside. So we do have memory expansion. There's our processor slot for the coprocessor. So it is upgradable. Ratcheting screwdrivers are so hot right now. Uh, the next step is to have a look inside this keyboard and see if there's any signs of anything that's bad, like bad capacitors, if there's a controller chip in here, and um, see if we can get the keyboard working and if that's the reason why it's just beeping. So let's have a look at this keyboard. I have found some information that could be very helpful to us. I do know how it works internally, but it didn't really tell me how to take it apart. And I see lots of plastic clips around the edge. So I'm guessing that's where we start. The trick is, can I do it without breaking anything? And can I do it while I'm showing you? This is off to a great start. So I'm trying to hold these clips open. Nope, that's one broken already. They were all snapped. I don't know if I care now. There we go. That's one way to Ruin a keyboard. Yes, off. Oh, that's so annoying. We should be able to actually power this up, just five volt and ground, and then we can monitor the ACK lines and see if it's actually doing anything. I'm gonna skip past a lot of this because it was kind of pointless I didn't record the output from the oscilloscope, so I can't show you the signals. 
So let's just quickly skip through it. So I do connect up the keyboard controller to the bench power supply and make sure that it works. It's stable. It's not spitting out garbage like we think we're doing with the keys that it was pressing keys all the time. I did look at the signals, but I just didn't record it. So let's just move on. Next, we connect it up to the Amstrad and we do a similar thing. We don't have the keyboard connected and we just see that it actually accepts the signal is okay and we don't get the beeping. So the controller is working. The Amstrad is accepting that the controller is connected. So we must have a problem with the membrane. So now that I've accepted that the controller is working okay and it's not spitting out garbage, I then proceed to connect up the keyboard back to the controller. And this is where I make a stupid mistake and I connect the keyboard membrane up backwards and then spend the rest of the afternoon trying to fix something which isn't connected up correctly. What an idiot. So I connect it back up, we plug it into the Amstrad and it just doesn't do anything. I have established that we have a problem with the membrane anyway. So the next step was to take the keyboard apart. And yet again, we have plastic clips on the bottom, but thankfully I don't break any this time. It was fairly easy to take those off. So I removed the supporting metal part on the bottom. And then we look at the membrane and I clean the top and bottom of the membrane. I did try to separate the membrane layers to clean inside, but I wasn't sure how to do it. So I decided I didn't want to just in case it damaged it. So we'll give the keyboard a quick blast with the compressed air. Right, so yet again, I connect up the membrane, this time without the keys pressing down on them. And I connect it up backwards. So even if I did get it working, it wouldn't work because I'm an idiot. So I think my next plan is to make a system disk. I do have a configuration disk and we'll see if we can find out what key it is that's getting stuck down. Something's obviously not happy on the membrane, but I don't think I can take this membrane apart to, to clean it on the other side. Found, um, I need DOS 4 and I've made a disk and the disk drive does not work. So I'm not going to get very far with that, am I? All right, let's quickly take this apart. It feels like the mechanism is very stiff. So I think uh, let's quickly do some service and lubrication on this. Now we have the top off the drive. I'm going to use some PTFE lubrication and just put some on the corners. The top of the mechanism slides like up and down in a groove and it was very gummed up. So I use the PTFE and slowly work it so um, eventually it moves nice and freely. We can put the disc in and eject the disc again and then we can give it another go. So let's try turning in this one again. It is making a noise like the floppy drive is trying to do something. So let's turn that off. We have our temporary keyboard arrangement. The floppy drive is moving. Yes. Yes, it's booting. I don't know what this disc is. It was the only one I could find that was a 1.4 uh, disc image. And we've got an A prompt. We have an A prompt. We have an A prompt. Pressing the space key. Uh, well, that's, that's good news. 
uh, well, we have made some progress. We've got it to boot, got a floppy disk working. It's no longer making a horrible noise when we turn it on, but the keys are just garbage. I decided to quickly have a look at the hard drive and it is a Western Digital. The motor is spinning and I was looking at the board so we could remove those tantalums and uh, check them, read the capacitance of them, make sure they're okay. 9.4, 10.4 and 10. So none of them are, are really out of spec. So you could say that it's not those. So I've put those back in. They tested okay. Let's quickly check across these other big caps. That one. So they're not short. Yeah, two microfarad, 2.2. Let's try turning the board on with the bench power supply. Okay, so five volt, one amp. So it's on and it's drawing 0.3 amps. And the hard drive light flickers for a second. I'm connected up to the other lead now. We could try the 12 volt. And we're pulling 0.2 amps. So there's nothing on the board, on this board, that's pulling too much current. We'll try plugging it back in again. Okay, let's try turning it on the 12 volt. And again, it's only pulling a very small amount. Okay, let's try the 5 volt. And again, only a small amount. Let's try this again. It's making a noise. It hasn't restarted. Oh, ho, ho, ho. holy fish! The hard drive spins up. So I don't know if it was just because I moved the motor and and it was maybe stuck. That's all I can think of. So I precariously balanced everything on here again. Is that because it doesn't know about what the drive is? So do we need to run some kind of setup program? Which I do have, but I can't, I do have the setup program, but I can't run it because the keyboard isn't working. So unless I can get the keyboard working, I'm stuffed, aren't I? So yeah, that, that really is it. I need the keyboard to work to do anything. Well, we've got the hard drive to spin up, and, and the light's flashing, no more errors. We can move from a floppy disk, but I can't do anything else until the keyboard is working. It locks. The next day. So I got home and I put out a call for help on Twitter. Luckily for me, Retro Theory had previous experience with these Amstrad models and he told me what I needed to do and how to do it. So step one was take the keyboard apart again and I was very happy that I didn't break any more of the brittle plastic clips. Next is to separate the two layers of the membrane and I used the two points where it connects to the keyboard controller and gently pull them apart doing my very best not to tear anything. It felt very sticky, I wasn't sure if this was normal or if this was my problem all along 
the layers were sticking to each other. So Retro Theory specifically told me not to use IPA to clean, and so I used Deoxit and some cotton pads to carefully clean the top and bottom layers of the membrane. The last step was pulling it back together. I lined up the top and bottom layers using the dots of each key. This was a little bit tricky, but I just took my time and then I could align the two layers of the membrane to the cutouts in the metal chassis. All right, I've got the Amstrad back on the desk. I've got the keyboard, we just need to plug the cables back in. All right, so I'm just double checking and it's that way. Let's turn it on. I, I haven't put the LEDs back in yet. Yes, yes. I edited the floppy disk so that it's not doing so much. Oh, yes! HG. Would you look at that? You beauty! Thank you, Retro Theory! Now we have a working keyboard, we can run the setup program. I did some Googling and I found a page that said this type of hard drive is a Type 4. So that's what I tried at first. I couldn't get out of the setup program because I had no escape key. So I borrowed the escape key from F5. So I was able to exit and I booted from a floppy disk just in case. And I tried to get to the C prompt, made a mistake, typed duh instead. But as we can see, we got sector not found. And that's because this isn't a type or hard drive. I then saw that there was number two written in red marker on the front of the drive. And I thought, let's give that a go. And as it turns out, it was formatted as type two. And we were initially able to get a directory reading. Unfortunately, it really struggled to boot, and I thought this was because it was the wrong hard drive type still, but it just turns out that the drive was still a bit seized up, and it needed some time to loosen up, and bit by bit, it just got better and better. Everything was progressing nicely, so I decided to put some of the case back together. The floppy drive goes back in, and then we put the metal case on the hard drive and screw that back together and just position everything in the case and then we can put the top of the case back on and connect up the batteries so that it will remember the hard drive type and we can do some more testing. Let's give it another boot and see if we've made any progress on freeing up that hard drive and as we can see we are getting through the boot sequence with less and less errors but unfortunately it gets to the end and we still have a sector error. But we definitely got a lot further than we did before. I decided to grab my XT IDE with a compact flash and put it in an ISA slot. Didn't have a free power lead in the back, uh, so I just used uh, an ISA card that I connected up to 5 watt and ground to to give power to the compact flash. And that worked perfectly. My plan for using the compact flash was to make a backup of the hard drive, just in case there was anything that was interesting on there. I wasn't sure what drive ladder it was going to give us, and had a few experiments along the way, and it turns out that the compact flash was D, and the original drive was still C. We did have a couple of errors while booting, but eventually we did get there. I then create a backup folder on the compact flash called backup, and I was messing about with X copy. It must have been an older version of Xcopy because it wouldn't let me use some of the normal commands that I do. But I managed to get it to create a directory and copy all the files over, creating the subfolders as it went. It got so far and then eventually we did get a sector error and I had to stop it. I tried the backup again and this time it was successful. There wasn't really anything of interest on there there was some word perfect stuff, there was battle chess and a flight simulator. But we were successful in backing up the hard drive and freeing up the hard drive mechanism. So that was it. 
I pretty much backed up the hard drive and let's have a quick look. So first of all, there was an Amstrad demo, which was basically FLI, which is an old video compressed format. It was mainly about the Amstrad PC 2286. Eventually work out how to quit out of that. And then I load up the flight simulator. I had no idea what the keys were. So I just mashed the keyboard and then eventually had to turn it off to restart and then had a quick look at battle chess and again didn't really know what i was doing with that but that was it they were all running off the actual hard drive not from the backup so i was very very happy with the progress that i'd made in this amstrad pc2286 wow that was a great weekend i had lots of fun working on this saturday and sunday and we were able to get it working absolutely fantastic I did, really didn't think that I would be able to get it working so soon. We still have a lot of work to do, lots of cleaning. We need to properly service the hard drive. It was gradually getting better, so I'm guessing it needs some proper lubrication. We need to finish off the keyboard, put the LEDs back in, maybe make sure that the LEDs work, and then look at the case because I did damage some of the clips. And also we should really clean the keys up before we do put it all back together because then hopefully that will be the last time that I need to open it. So I look forward to part two. I'm not quite sure when it will be, because that is a lot of work to do. Probably the next video will be the Mega Drive. I've got two Mega Drives that are faulty, so um, that should be a, an easy one to do. Thank you for watching this video. Give me a thumbs up, like and subscribe, and all that YouTube stuff, you know what I'm saying? And I will see you on the next one. Bye!